Welcome to another episode of Innovation and the Future of Pharmacovigilance, a podcast series brought to you by Trulian Talks. I'm your host, Indy Alawalia, and I'm delighted to navigate the dynamic world of pharmacovigilance and risk management with you. Uh, a quick disclaimer first, the opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of the individual guest and do not necessarily reflect the official views of Trulian Consulting or their own company. We're all about fostering insightful conversations here at Trillion Talks, and we want you to know that any product, vendor, or service mentioned does not imply an endorsement. If you're seeking professional advice for specific situations, we encourage you to go to our experts. Please remember, this podcast content is meant for informational and educational purposes only. So, today, we are incredibly fortunate to have Rishi Chopra, Executive Director, Global Head of Pharmacovigilance Regions, and also Deputy UK QPPV as our guest speaker. Rishi, it's fantastic to have you here. Hi, Andy. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for the invitation and, uh, yeah, this opportunity to speak to you. We've known each other for quite a bit, so I feel like I'm talking to a friend. So uh, <laughs> appreciate it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you have been a, a pretty much my whole uh, PV career, I think I've... Uh, I've pretty much seen you everywhere, uh, every conference, every. I think he even did an interview once. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah. Um, I think the first thing that I I, I want to ask is, uh, how did you get into PV? <laughs> yeah, good, good question. I think uh, with a lot of folks that that enter pharmacovigilance, um, it's probably not the case that when they were asked when they were a five year old what they want to be when they grow up, it's a but the answer was probably wasn't PV professional. <laughs> um, but really, look, I, I did a, a undergraduate um, a course in, in biochemistry and, you know, coming out of um, that bachelor's, I still didn't really understand what I wanted to do. Um, I think all I really knew that I, I didn't really want to uh, stay in the labs. I didn't think that was for me. Um, I think by nature, I, I get my energy from people. So whatever I wanted uh, to do in the future had to be centered around collaborating with folks, you know. So that much I knew, but not not specifically. Um, and so then I went on to kind of prolong my uh, educational experience um, uh, and maybe some time in the student union bar uh, by uh, doing another course in uh, in a, it was a master's in in pharmaceutical science and business management and that was a really interesting course because it was at kingston university and it was a hybrid course so the pharmaceutical science piece is everything that you would expect is understanding each component of the pharmaceutical industry and within that there was a module of pharmacovigilance and um but the other half was the first time that they had offered it uh, was an opportunity to do some business management modules with the business management cohort of students. And I was the first from the life science side to do that. So it was just me from the life science um, cohort, um, uh, understanding and taking part in some of the modules with the pure business management um, students. So that was really interesting. The first time I had uh, been exposed to anything from, from that perspective. And it really taught me about not only um, uh, you know the scientific side, but it also taught me about how companies uh, operate, which was which was uh, a, a good insight. But um, like I said, there was a PV module in there. Then after that, um, really, uh, uh, I had a cousin that was working uh, um, in regulatory affairs within the industry. She had been working in the industry for several years. So really, that was the first point of inspiration to start thinking about the, the pharmaceutical industry post masters. And I was very lucky enough to to really get my first job in PV almost immediately after I'd finished my master's at Kingston. So, um, yeah, that's really the story. And no, I don't, I wouldn't say it was a, it was a, a, a carefully structured plan and strategy to get into PV. But I, I mean, I, I truly mean this. I was lucky enough to uh, fall into PV and then from there on kind of build a, a career in there. Mm. And that first role was at Roche. Is that right? Yeah, it was at Rush. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And how was that experience for you to, you know, newly, newly graduated out of uh, Kingston and straight into 
Ross. Yeah, yeah I think it was uh, actually very lucky for me to get uh, my first job in industry and in farm convergence uh, at a company like Roche, a fantastic organization. And like I said, I get, get my energy from people. And I think the most striking thing about my time at Roche as a, if you like, the first real job, right, um, apart from uh, working in retail uh, during university was was the fact that I was joining a, a real community of, of folks in a, in a global farm convergence department. And really, the environment was all about sharing, partnering, learning, and so it was a it was an excellent entry um, for me into the industry, and and really learn from some. I mean, not only great managers, um, but but just have fantastic colleagues around us. And I think maybe showing the age, but it was back in the day. You you, you know you get into case processing as your entry level role, for example, and. We did everything. Ha- have the opportunity to try everything, um, whether it was processing different cases, whether it was learning about training, process it, uh, process management, outsourcing strategy. I mean, it was a great environment uh, for someone um, that was really eager to learn uh, uh, farm convergence at, at a foundational level. So it gave me a, a fantastic foundation from there. So I think Roche was a fantastic experience, and like I say, very lucky uh, because. Uh, kept connections, really strong connections ever since then and, and, and have been very proud to see the trajectory of, of, of my colleagues um, from those days. So, so yeah, fantastic experience. And uh, that early on, did you know where you wanted to go in your PV journey or was it just, well, I'm processing cases, I'm learning a bit of the safety side stuff. Uh, I think signaling might have been just uh, was signaling uh, just sort of in its infancies or sort of very basic signaling at that point. I mean, I had exposure to that side um, at a very, very foundational level, you know, not not, mm-hmm. not in, um, in too much detail. Um, to answer your question, did I really know where I wanted to go from there? The answer is is n- n- no, not really. I, I, all I knew at that point, it was only the – first two or three years of my career, right, was and really getting to understand farm convergence. And I have to be honest, because at that point, you don't really, or I did not have a, a really um, intimate understanding about the importance of patient safety and farm convergence, right? You you get the foundational training, which tells you about the thalidomide disaster, et cetera, the foundations of, and the roots of farm convergence as we know it today. But, but it really didn't, if I can say, hit home yet at that mm-hmm. point and so what i did know is that i wanted to further my journey and and, and education in farm convergence if you like um by taking up a, 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 a another opportunity at, at glaxo smith Klein, which mm-hmm. really took me from a global uh um a function into a local function so i i took a, a role within the local safety team in gsk's uh, uk affiliate which again was a, a a real fantastic experience so to answer your question i don't really know again did i especially target that next move no there was an opportunity that came up and it really struck me that this offers a, a different insight from a different perspective from a local perspective um a little bit closer to the needs of the local business as well as the local patient population um and also a different um uh, therapeutic portfolio uh, which was interesting, very diverse portfolio at GlaxoSmithKline, you know, including vaccines and HIV portfolio uh, on top of the respiratory oncology. So that really um, was an attraction for me to, to to take up the role at GSK and have a new experience. I mean, that's uh, it's, it's quite fun. It's quite it's quite incredible. You had this uh, your early part of your career was literally you had the global outlook as your first um in uh, sort of introduction into pv and then you went down to the local level um was it at this point that you started to get more involved with industry associations or was that a bit later on yeah it was no it was at glaxo smith klein so you you're taking me back and you have to remember now <laughs> but yeah, so it was at glaxo smith klein i think 
uh, what had happened at that point is um, my manager was um, very involved with uh, both Piper and the ABPI Farm Convergence Expert Network. And I think mm -hmm. there was a couple of times where she gave me the opportunity and um, maybe we'll come back to it later, but I've always had fantastic managers that have offered me opportunity and, and, and allowed me to grow, which is really important. But she gave me that opportunity to take part. There's a lot of trust there because representation of the company and, and, and uh, providing valuable input into some of these trade associations is really important. And so um, fantastic amount of trust that was placed in me, but it was a great opportunity to, again, I think it was the first time I got the opportunity to work on something with um, with colleagues from other companies and other parts of the industry. So yeah, I think it was Piper and then ABPI Farm Convergence Expert Network that, that I started to interact with during my time at GSK. Yeah. Was that surprising to you uh, that industry did collaborate in that way? Uh, that's a good question. Was it surprising to me? I, I don't think it was actually. I don't think it was particularly surprising to me. Um, but for me personally, it was it was something brand new um, to see how um, um, trade associations and industry associations can have a really important um, influence and contribution to to our overall uh, uh, farmer convergence framework, right? And and I think. I mean, in other ways, GSK had really given me the appreciation, started to give me the true appreciation of the impact of the work that we do within patient safety and farm convigilance, um, uh, you know, to, to the population in terms of health and well-being. Um, but from a trade association perspective, we started to work on some papers um, that influenced the way that we do things. And it was all in the ultimate interest of, of, of patient safety and compliance. And so that started to give me a deeper appreciation of the value of of colleagues across the industry and trade associations in in having a, a a positive influence around how we can kind of progress things, you know, in the name of the patient. So, yeah, it, it wasn't surprising me that they were interacting, but the the impacts, the positive impact, was was definitely something uh, that was a uh, uh, something new to me, and and, and it was a great exposure. Yeah, and I think that's the first time that I, I had actually heard your name, which was the, I think it was the ABPI guidance for digital media and, and, and PV. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that was... That point, I? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it was good. Um, but, I mean, it's quite interesting that, you know, uh, where are we... T uh, t um, 10 years later 11 years later it's still the it's still the guidance that people still look to which is a uh, maybe slightly a sad indictment of how we haven't moved on as an industry um or we don't move quick enough or it's the fact that it's it's lasted its time and i i that might have sounded a bit offensive but i didn't mean it to sound offensive it's just i guess it's the way it is and and i believe at that point, you were about to move to Janssen, is that right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, on the paper that that had been developed subsequent to that, um, uh, 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 several times, even by mm. some of my team members at the companies that I joined later on. Um, and I think it, it was just it's just testament to the fact that that area is is complex, right? Um, um, quite rightfully, there is a lot more red tape. Um, and 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 uh, um, uh, the framework around how pharma and biotech operates in the public space, including social social media. Quite rightly so. We're, we're dealing with not to underplay it, but life and death. Sometimes we're dealing with people's mm -hmm. health, which is a really really important topic. And so um, it's not so easy because technology moves incredibly fast, mm -hmm. right? And uh, all of social and digital has moved incredibly fast. Platforms and the use of the platforms have, have moved and developed even more so. So um, it, it's it's difficult to kind of tie down uh, uh, guidance and framework which will ever last that pace of change, right? So I think the industry and companies have to keep thinking, keep talking, keep being pragmatic in terms of how they operate 
and just keep um, patient safety and, and compliance at the core of what they do. And then they'll steer themselves in the right direction, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, you're going back to the other uh, question around my move from there on. And it, it really was at a point where, again, because of the, the, the trust and the faith that, that my manager had with me at that time, she gave me more opportunities to 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 kind of take on supervisory roles at times and also backup roles for her when she was uh, uh, not there um, and that gave me a flavor of, of what it was like to 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 I guess first lead a team or, or to actually uh, coordinate a team supervise a team mm -hmm. and that's what I wanted to do next I really wanted to manage a team and that's where the opportunity at Janssen came along and uh, um, it was uh, again really fantastic experience fantastic um company and uh learned a huge amount we went through uh some really dynamic and testing uh times quite rightly like ex inspections etc mm -hmm. but really positive experiences and outcomes uh from them and once again you know really had the opportunity to make some firm friends and and uh uh, ever since that I've kind of maintained uh, contact with ever since and uh, yeah so so went to Janssen to take up a role in in managing uh, uh, a team within pharmacovigilance operations uh, and it was a UK based team that eventually was also joined that I had to, to manage a US based team as well so again a, a fantastic experience and I think during that time I first started to interact more closely with the functions like the EU QPPV, other PV operations roles, the affiliates. Um, and I think it, um, it was then around about 2012, right, when the GBP modules first came out and then yep. the experience of, of, of leading and coordinating the implementation of GBP module six, which is, I guess, for PV has been a significant uh, milestone event, right? And and uh, uh, those modules are still around and being updated. So, so it was a it was a significant milestone and experience for me. Um, but yeah, so that was a, a, a fantastic uh, move for me. Yeah. And also around that time, you were also doing a white paper uh, for Tufts. Yeah, yeah, Tufts. Yeah. So this was something that. Um, uh, during that time, there was, uh, again, an industry-wide um, initiative with Tufts, led by Tufts University to start looking at, again, in the area of social media. So it was just, a, um, I guess, my it's really sparked my interest during my time at GSK around digital and social and how that was being used. And I have to say, in those early years, um, it was still a, a, a lot of... Uh, ambiguity about the value of the data that was on social and digital media right and uh, mm -hmm. fought with with complexities like the risk of duplication and noise and false reports so it was really just an opportunity to 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 further my experience in talking with colleagues across the industry and varying different experiences um so yeah so that was uh, another opportunity to be exposed to to that area so you're at Janssen, you've you've probably grown into a uh, into being a leader at this point. You've 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 got your experiences from the past. You've you've been able to be part of this this whole GVP module rollout, which uh, I think that was pretty early on in my career, and it was huge. Um, uh, and I was at a small company at the time, so. I can only imagine for someone like at Janssen, it was um, it was a big, big deal. And then, what made you decide? Okay, now's the time to move on. Yeah, I mean, did I re? I don't know if I really started my journey in terms of being a a, a, a full blown leader at that point in Janssen. Certainly, it was my first experience of managing people. But you know, there's. Mm -hmm difference between just managing people and, and being a leader in fact in my view you don't have to manage people to be a leader right so um different slightly different concepts but sometimes intertwined uh, as well certainly that experience of managing people was great you know looking after 
as really good managers had looked after me in terms of my own development and opportunity, trying to practice what I'd learned from those managers and look after the development and the opportunity of others. So that was that was a fantastic experience. And um, uh, yeah, like you said, uh, um, implementing GVP module six was was a, a, a great experience and it was daunting at the beginning because it is a large organization and it, it was complex you had the farmer and the consumer portfolio um and it was implementation across uh, uh, both sides of that business um but that's when i say that that that's when i started to get exposed more and more to the affiliates uh, to the yeah. affiliate sector so talking and partnering with the safety officers understanding how their countries were um implementing the eu uh, guidelines at a local legislative level a local guidance level uh, and interacting and understanding and appreciating that there are different flavors of interpretation country to country um and that that was fascinating to me it really was and i guess i wanted to build on that experience of an, an opportunity to kind of interact with the uh, different affiliates and different countries and so an opportunity came up at Takeda um, and uh, where I would be a, a regional lead uh, company mm -hmm. in the Russia CIS region of, of affiliates um, so I, I, I took that as, an, as kind of the next step of my, my, my journey you know so it was, it was if you like I went from a global office um, into a regional center or a regional capacity, but still as a representative of the global office at Takeda, global PV at Takeda. So, so yeah, that was the that was the reason why I wanted to move into that role. Really, um, is to is to really uh, get more experience and more exposure of interacting more closely with the affiliates, and not only the PV folks um, within the countries, but also the broader business. Um, um, so yeah, so that's what what took me there. And then from then you went to Otsuka. Yeah. Right? Yeah, Otsuka, um, yeah, a previous uh, manager had, uh, referred me to, to an opportunity at Otsuka, which was to kind of, um, uh, uh, kind of lead the compliance framework there, especially in the run up to an important, uh, inspection. Um, and, uh, it was really looking at uh, the compliance with module two, uh, what should be in the farm division system master file, supporting the setup of a, of a compliance management framework, um, continuing to work really closely with the, the EU QPPV and the folks in the QPPV office, as well as other folks within PV operations and um, CAPA management. So yeah, great, great experience. And that, uh, Osuka again, very lucky to to join a fantastic company with with uh, a fantastic heritage um, uh, and um, a beautiful organisational culture. Um, and it was you know great again to 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 interact with folks, but from a different lens, you know, uh, compared to my previous experiences. Um, and yeah, it was it was just good to kind of get that. Um, to 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 try my hand at a different part of the farm convergence uh, work or oversight framework, you know. And and then the thing that surprised me because I didn't realise you were there for so long was Biogen. I, I didn't realise you were there for well over six years. Yeah, it was about. It was. I think it was coming up to six years. Um, I think. I think I really had. Um, I really decided that uh, at that point that I really wanted to go back to uh, um, working with the affiliate sector. I, I really mm -hmm. enjoyed it at Takeda. I really enjoyed being part of the affiliate at GSK. And again, I had the interactions with the affiliate community within uh, both Janssen and, and at Otsuka, but still within compliance. And I, I just wanted to go back to that, you know? So the, the role was really attractive um you know and and actually that, that that's even more so the people that had interviewed me really gave me uh, the motivation to join that, that organization you know um mm -hmm. it felt like um things were still building 
it felt like there was a tremendous opportunity to build a, a true farm convergence community with the affiliate sector. Um, I would be working um, not just but within one region, but leading all regions of affiliates across the globe. So it was an expansion. It was the next mm -hmm. uh, logical expansion to what I was doing at Takeda. And it was the also the opportunity to first time join the, the global PV leadership team. Um, so again, it was, I guess it was the next step in my overall development and learning was then to start practicing, providing a contribution to um, a farm convergence leadership beyond my immediate remit, right? Mm. So mm -hmm. yes, I'm coming from the perspective of I lead the, the affiliate network um, uh, function, but it was well beyond that, how do you provide a contribution to the betterment of the farm convergence system uh, alongside my colleagues that are you know, on the PV leadership team, right? So so that was again an experience as well. Yeah. Uh, and at and at this point at Biogen, this is when you again were heavily involved with some of the industry um uh uh yeah, some of the associations, etc. There we go. <laughs> yeah. At this point, yeah. So you were at some industry associations, um Yeah. You were of... you were doing some lecturing, like there was a whole load of things happening for you at that point, right? Yeah, I mean, it, in phases. <laughs> um, so for a long time, it was really about um, establishing myself as well as my ideas on creating a, 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 a really unified farm convergence system that, that was inclusive of all of the affiliates around the world, right? Because... Mm -hmm. um, I think that it, it, prior there had been a level of decentralization of how farm convergence had, had functioned within the affiliate sector. So it was to kind of harmonize that um, over the few years. So really it was focused on that for the first few years. And then maybe as I kind of got more comfortable and established in the role, and I think that's important, I think um, for anybody kind of considering the extracurricular stuff, it's, it's really nice, but, you know, you have to, uh, pay focus to to the core role right um and so that was my focus for a few years and then um i, I don't know it just felt like it, there was again it was just uh, by chance interaction with um a lecturer of one of my previous universities at, at kingston um and then also i would get the uh, alumni newsletters from Westminster and so then there was reach outs from those universities to see whether there was any chance of me doing some lectures and I thought that would be quite useful because I think when I did um, I mean there's been fun other great courses like uh, the the PV course at, at Hertfordshire University mm -hmm. of um, which I did a diploma in but uh, and so they offer great teachings in 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 farm convergence but I thought in some of the other uh, courses at certainly the universities that I have been in, it would be great to get direct experience or for the students to have, uh, uh, um, you know, interaction with someone from the industry to give them. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that's what I did. So at University of, of uh, Kingston, I gave kind of like an industry perspective. And then from uh, for University of Westminster, I was interacting with them around the importance of mentorship and, and leadership. And they also had a... Uh, a series called What It Takes. So it's for the students to to kind of get different insights from different um, industries as to what it takes to become a leader or what it takes to, you know, uh, various different topics. So, so yeah, so that's when I started to kind of <laughs> practice lecturing to, to, to students, which is a, a different experience, you know, yeah. And and finally, you you've ended up now where you are at CSL. Yeah. And how? And actually, if I look at your whole career, I, I sometimes I ask people about how they feel about working with companies from, you know, that have have got different cultures. So you know, we have the Japanese culture, the Swiss culture, the UK culture, etc. You've actually managed to pretty much hit everything every single one of those sort of companies. Yeah, um, I, wasn't, I wasn't following a, a checkbox. Uh, no. 
or companies and cultures that I wanted to cover. Uh, quite sincerely, um, I think this, there's a couple of things that have influenced my decision to 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 explore uh, new opportunities, which have been about um, people, um, and it's been about the role. And and in those two aspects, it was just a, a compelling, really compelling um, situation, where, which led me to join CSL, a fantastic organisation. Um, people are. Uh, passionate uh, really about this topic of patient safety and um, there is such great opportunity to put your mark on on things and really influence and drive forward and um, look I'm, I'm still learning um, from from great leaders and that hasn't changed today you know and that has been the 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 real stimulating factor is can I continue my learning journey um, and can I keep doing the things that I'm particularly passionate about, which is patient safety? And like I said at the beginning, did I really have an appreciation of the contribution that pharmacovigilance uh, uh, functions make to patient safety? I didn't, not in those early years, for sure not. But, you know, throughout my career, I've had the opportunity to do, talk directly to patients and healthcare professionals. I understand what it means to them um, to take um, and have access to to, to potentially life changing therapies, right? Um, and I've seen the important work that we do right across all functions of pharmacovigilance in that mission. And I've also seen the the variety uh, through the different countries in in terms of what it means to provide more more tailored or specific or nuanced. Uh, um, um, uh, service to, to patient safety and so I really wanted to continue my journey in the affiliate sector and again it's the opportunity was the role at CSL but really importantly it was the leadership it was the people that really have, have kind of brought me here and look you know I've been blessed in, in that way and I continue my journey in that way and I've got fantastic colleagues around me and this is a uh, um, uh, 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 a, a really fantastic step for me so that's why i'm here at csl and it's already been almost two years since i've been here so uh yeah it's going really well and <clears throat> you talk about uh, a, a a lot about the the leaders that you've had throughout your career and how influential they are um what is it about those those particular leaders that helped you throughout your career that you, I guess, are you grateful for, or what is it that made them stand out to you and made you want to pursue yourself and uh, uh, your learnings going forward? Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. So I think on reflection, uh, the, the reason why I say I've been lucky with the managers and the leaders that I've been exposed to is because I found that those um, man, so if we start with the managers, my direct managers, they I've always had the opportunity to try something new, and sometimes make uh, measured mistakes, you know, um, and learn from them quickly. Uh, and so that's something that I kind of hold dear in the way that I try to manage people is to give opportunity, allow them to expand the breadth of what they currently know and and do and try something different. Because I think out of that kind of you, 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 you can breed more innovation and uh, also personal development for the individual. Um, but then a lot of those leaders, so not only the managers, but the leaders that I've been exposed to have kind of um, led by example, right? And I've, I've particularly been blessed with being surrounded by uh, leaders with individuality, right? They, they, mm -hmm. they, they, there's something about them that separates them or differentiates them from the next leader. And every different style has something to offer in my uh, belief, right? And um, I would also say I've been, I've been blessed to have uh, authentic leaders. So, and I think, I think uh, that's a lot, a lot of people talk about authenticity as a, a leadership behavior, but it's really, really important to be a, a, an authentic leader. Uh, in my view, um, and that's what I've tried to emulate the best that I can is just to be myself in terms of my personality, be humble about what I know, what I don't know, um, 
and uh, um, also allow people to be themselves, to be comfortable in their skin and and uh, uh, be as inclusive as possible. So, yes, I think that I think those are the leaders that I've, I've really appreciated and again, have been very blessed to have uh, to help me develop my own career. And, and, and you have a very big sense of paying it back as well. Uh, it comes through a lot that you want to be able to pay back what people have ha, have given the opportunities to to yourself. Uh, and the one thing that I that I think about is in the world of PV that we're in right now. How do leaders pay back to the the newer generation of PV leaders that are potentially coming through? Uh, it's a good question. I, I mean, look, I'm still learning, right? So there is there is there is that. So I think it's the first understanding is that my way isn't the the it's not the the way it's not the no. only way right mm-hmm. and it's not necessarily correct in all fashions but but it's the way that suits me that I, that I do it with really positive intent and I think that's the key thing is to 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 make sure that we kind of uh, um, um, uh, give our folks the space to 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 positively contribute to whatever they do and understand whatever contribution that they make we should assume positive intentions and um some people may think it's classed as paying back but i actually get something out of it myself so mm-hmm. it's not uh completely uh um uh, selfless right it's it i get something out i get i feel like a reward if i'm kind of you know going to some of these lectures and I don't do it very often. I might do it like once every year or a couple of years. But whenever I do get the opportunity to do it, I do feel like it, there is something that I get back out of it in terms of just sharing an experience. And I think it's valuable because when you're in, maybe we all know this, when we're in university, I mean, what do we know about operating in a, in a corporate environment and, and some of the finer details of operating in, in matrixed environments, et cetera? We, we don't. And I think sharing that perspective from an early stage, uh, more to do with the soft skills, et cetera, is just as important as the technical knowledge that they'll learn from their courses, right? So so I, I do think there is a value with with folks from industry providing perspective um, back to the students that are still learning and and uh, and uh, and but like like I say, it was not it's not it's paying it back maybe a little bit, but but it's also I get something out of that, you know. Yeah. Is there any leader that you can think of that you would name check this instant and say this person's view is something that I or this person's way of being a leader is something I aspire to? I think, look, I, like I say, I've been blessed to have really good managers and leaders uh, around me throughout throughout my career. Re- really good, you know. I've learned from all of them and I continue learning today. I'm very blessed today to have the leaders that I have and the managers that I have today and, and learning from them. I think um, <clears throat> it more so than name checking, I think it's about the profile of a leader that I've really appreciated. Again, going back to the things that I talked about, real authentic leaders, leaders that are really comfortable in who they are. Um, and uh, I find it, it just uh, um, brilliant that that people can be who they are and offer something different and re- big believer in in diversity of, of contribution right um and inclusivity and and you know for me that that's what i've been blessed with is those those leaders that are really comfortable with their brand of leadership and are and are authentic and that's what i've always tried to aspire to to, to be myself is yeah i i i think that's that's fair so <clears throat> The name of the podcast is Innovation and the Future of Pharmac Vigilance. So we have to ask this question, what what is next for PV? What's the next thing? Yeah, I think I think probably the, the obvious one that you know we've been talking about for the last couple of years, at least in industry, is is the advent of uh, technology and the progress that, that will that will make and enhance in terms of our procedures and the way that we do things. So specifically, um, AI, generative AI, NLP, etc. Um, I think all of that will will definitely contribute. Uh, I think that's a given that that will play a massive role. And for some companies that are further along 
um, than others in. You know, it's already playing a role for them in some way. So I think that's that's really important, and it will probably free up uh, the capacity to look at more value add. Um, and I think he, um, I mean, and that and that a lot of the conversation in around that is on the back end of how do we use AI for data management? You know, we've in regulation with progressively we're asking to collect more and report more. And I think AI has a has the support uh, uh, opportunity for that. On the other side, I think it'll be interesting how the rest of or, or the, the organization or the industry utilizes technology and taps into into sources or potential new sources of data or uh, or underused sources of data. Right? So it's always been a concept in farm convergence that there is severe underreporting of AEs. Um, a lot of the times when, when people report adverse events, are they reporting it purely for the sake of reporting an adverse event? Uh, well, quite frequently they're reporting because they're mentioning it in the context of something else that they want out of it, whether it's medical information or, or to share a story or, or, or to get other people's experiences. And I wonder whether, um, again, we talk about the social and digital media at the beginning, there's always people are dubious about, well, what kind of quality of data is really out there? But I wonder whether those same data sources will become richer in the future, mainly because of, well, number one, patients are becoming more learned about their conditions and their treatments and the disease, and they want more uh, uh, of a, an active contribution in that journey. Um, so are they now also building stronger communities with their with other patients of the same area? and and uh, talking about their therapy and their treatments more and their experiences and i wonder whether some of that data is becoming richer out there and, and again is yet to be untapped and i think the, the technology just as much as it has a role in supporting the the, the back end of data management um it also has a role in 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 perhaps in a more efficient way helping us to tap into those uh, new data sources. Um, so it's yet to be discovered, but I think that's the future is, is to, how do we leverage technology more and more, um, both from the aspect of data management, but also to maybe explore if there are new data sets out there that provide a, a richer and more uh, um, fuller insight into the patient or the experience, right? Um, so I think I think that's one thing. I think the other thing is that that is also uh, aligned to this concept is I also think that medicine is moving towards more personalized experiences. Mm -hmm. So um, in previous companies, I've seen the the, the value that uh, medical devices uh, and digital uh, has on the overall patient experience. Um, so again, I wonder whether the patient will become more of a collaborator in the the generation of their own data, uh, yeah, and the assessment of their data. And so I wonder the role of, of uh, if there's going to be a much stronger role for the patient within industries. We talk about patient centricity. Maybe there's going to be a chief patient officer um, in a lot of companies in the future. So again, I think that as healthcare develops, the and technology develops around it and the patient becomes more learned uh, about their own treatment and disease outcomes and wants more of a, an in personal investment in that journey uh, uh, other than just looking to their healthcare professional for advice. Um, I, I think the data will become richer and uh, will probably have uh, a better outcomes and assessment and outcomes uh, on the back of it. That's fascinating. That's a that's a really good point. And actually, there's one other thing that came up, which I, I, I don't, we haven't really touched upon. But it is it's a big conversation at the moment about the convergence or the divergence of regulators and the way that they're looking um, at regulating uh, our industry. Um, you're getting some of the maybe not so traditional uh, regulators coming up with um, some regulations which are, you know, innovative, as it were, compared to maybe the bigger ones who are slightly slower to come to some sort of consensus uh, to be able to regulate the uh, the industry. And your role has obviously is is global in 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 that respect, and you see all this 
do you see any big changes or foresee any big changes in, in that in the future? Yeah, I think trade associations and, and many of the well-established regulators are are doing um, um, are putting in a lot of commitment to kind of uh, uh, work and collaborate with each other with with some of the burgeoning regulators out there, um, so that as much as possible we can harmonise and, and share experiences. So I think I think um, in a lot of the burgeoning regulators will see them advance uh, as well. Um, and I, I guess that's also why my job, I feel my job is particularly interesting because, you know, we, we're at the front end of, of having, uh, and, and being exposed to that, all of those varied requirements uh, country to country. Um, yeah, you know, belief that all of these, uh, the regulators, ultimately, we all want to do the same thing, which is to really make sure that the patients are, are served and uh, that we have their safety um, call, uh, everything what we do. So. I do think that there will be more uh, continuing efforts by trade associations as well as regulators to share experiences and opportunities to harmonise. Um, so we can expect more and more of that collaboration to happen. Um, so there's been the work that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has been doing. Uh, the MHRA has been really active um, outside of EU um, as well. Um, and uh, we know that many trade associations out there uh, are interacting very well with a lot of the regulators to share experiences and, and influence wherever they can. So I, I do think that um, we'll continue to see uh, variation in requirements um, country to country. And in some cases, rightfully so, they have patient uh, different patient demographics and different needs. Um, so we, we, should, we shouldn't necessarily expect to see exactly the same requirements everywhere. Um, but I think there will be a continuing effort globally to, to harmonize wherever possible. Rishi, thank you very much for joining me on this podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Yeah, thank you, Indy. Thanks. Uh, good chatting with you again. And uh, yeah, we'll go for a beer sometime. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks. Take care.